For those of you who took the consequences training earlier this year in Sacramento, uh, mid-May, we we had some was a power outage at the hotel, and we we tried to have a conversation about indirect life loss outside by the pool with a whole bunch of really loud construction equipment around us. So that was that was a bit of a challenge. Uh, this is this is a, a different presentation, but I'm gonna. I, I kept, I'm doing a little bit more of an expanded overview because of how we had to go through it at the consequences training. And then what I'm going to do is, is, so we're going to start with kind of an overview discussing the current guidance that we have in USACE for estimating indirect life loss and go through that more in-depth overview, if you will of the current method. And then I'm going to take you through an, an example of, of walking through that indirect, sorry, let me put that on your do not disturb, um, of walking through building the case and coming up with an indirect life loss method and how you can use output from LifeSim to do a lot of the work to support that indirect life loss estimate. All right, so a few years ago, two years ago, a little over two years ago, man, it seems like a much longer time. The pandemic really messed with the, with the space-time continuum, at least for me. And there, so we recognized the need to come up with a way to estimate indirect life loss. It, it was clear that it, played a role in aggregate mortality associated with different disasters. And it wasn't something that we were quantifying as part of our risk assessment practice. So <clears throat> these four gentlemen, Jason, Woody, uh, Nick Lutz, Ricky Oski, and myself uh, locked ourselves in a room for a week and tried to come up with a way, we, we gathered a fair amount of data beforehand, tried to come up with a way to estimate indirect life loss. So quickly, definitions, I talked earlier this week about direct flood fatality, that's what we're estimating in life, right? It's, it's attributed to a person's physical interaction with flooding. Common causes include drowning in structures and vehicles out in the open, uh, suffocation or, or physical trauma, whether it be from getting crushed by debris or structure collapse. If you listen to the various case history presentations we gave at the consequences training, you'll, you'll, you'll know, you should have a pretty good sense of what we mean by direct blood fatality. <clears throat> then some of these less frequent causes, roadway gives out and water's flowing over it so that can't be seen. Looks like it's, it's rather shallow. People try to drive through it and their car sinks, they drown, things like that. Direct flood fatalities do not include those caused by other environmental conditions. That's an important takeaway. So if a, a tree falls on you or high winds associated with a hurricane, those we don't count as direct flood fatalities, right? Now, Indirect flood fatalities is a, is a harder thing to ask. <clears throat> We've certainly spent more time refining our method for estimating direct flood fatalities. Estimating indirect flood fatalities is, is something that's relatively new for us. Um, direct flood fatalities we've been doing for 10, 15 years and, and really <clears throat> heavily refining that method over the last five to 10 years. And, that's what's got us to life in 2.0, right? We're really just at the beginning of, of this indirect life loss stuff. We've produced a paper. We had that reviewed by um, a doctor of, in health sciences at Michigan University who works with the National Academy of Sciences on kind of disaster science and particularly how we record mortality after disasters so she was a she was a great person to have review our method 
and we refined, we took her feedback and, and backed off on our method a little bit, and I'm going to go through that today. So indirect flood fatality is, can occur before, during, or after a major event. You know, direct flood fatalities are really in that short period during an, an active flood emergency, right? Whereas indirect fatalities can occur before, during, and after. So the period of time where indirect mortality can occur is quite a bit longer. Common causes are, are stress-induced, you know, particularly cardiovascular related, and then power related, exposure to extreme temperatures, infections from contact with water, lack of medical treatment medical treatment and not all of these things are are depend are independent right some of these things play on each other where you know if you had a loss of power and also and we're also exposed or in an area exposed to extreme temperatures like you know if, if you had no power and couldn't run fans or an air conditioner and you're in a hot humid area in the middle of summer during hurricane season you know that those two things combined can compound and create a more more difficult situation particularly if you're exposed to those to that environment for a longer period of time so indirect life loss when we're talking about indirect life loss with our method that that we've developed kind of our our initial method we're talking about really looking at during the flood and, and the short term period after. So about three, three months after, I would say. So during the flood, direct causes, drowning, collapse of structure, could have an accident or issue with medical equipment, you know, issue a power problem. Those, those things can all occur during the flood. Short term, whoops. You know, those first few months, uh, prolonged exposure to suboptimal conditions or extreme temperature, power problem where you can't run <clears throat> life-saving medical equipment, stress, you've, you've lost your home, you've lost all your worldly belongings, you can't afford to stay in a hotel, you're in a dire situation. At, can lead to indirect mortality in a number of ways. And then Woody mentioned Bankiao to you yesterday when, you know, talking about justifying your results and, and making the case for why your results make sense or might not. Bankiao's the deadliest dam failure on record. And some of these more long-term impacts, famine, disease, possibly political unrest, stress, Again, medical. So, saw a lot of those in Bankiao with that, you know, estimated approximately 200,000 indirect, indirect life, lives lost, famine and disease primarily, you know, situations where they were air dropping food that sat in ponded water, foodborne illness, things like that, that really contributed at 200,000 total. Our method, we really don't get into this period. A lot of that has to do with data uh, and the availability of the data. The further you move away from a disaster, the harder it is to attribute mortality explicitly to the disaster, right? It's possible that the disaster played a contributing role, but to say that the disaster was explicitly responsible for someone's death a year later, two years later, that that could be, that's generally pretty challenging. And you need a fair amount of observed data or, or empirical evidence to support that type of assertion. And with the data that we have available now, it's, it's really hard to, to make that case. So we're generally focused on the short-term period. So kind of at the point of disaster to about three months after. Bottom line up front, why is this so important? Well, a few years ago, these guys, uh, Rappaport and Blanchard, 
One works for the National Weather Service, one for the National Hurricane Center, NOAA's National Hurricane Center. They reviewed 59 tropical cyclones over a period of about 60 years from 1959 to 2012. And they found that total mortality or the total fatalities associated with those tropical cyclones, about half of those, half of the total mortality was due to indirect causes. That, that's significant, right? To say that mortality could be twice as large if you take into account indirect mortality. So that, that was one thing that really compelled us to get together and try to come up with a method for estimating indirect mortality. Um, and you'll see this note at the bottom, power availability is key. Rappaport and Blanchard found that cardiovascular disease or cardiovascular deaths were the leading cause of indirect fatalities, but power availability or power problems are antecedent to several other causes of indirect mortality. So this is, this is just a table that shows the findings from the Rappaport and Blanchard 2016 study. These are the top 10 events for indirect mortalities. You can see for the top 10 events, that's more than half of those, of those 59 hurricanes, the 10 events with the highest indirect life loss. For those events, more than half of the total life loss comes from indirect causes. And you can see some some pretty heavy hitters over the last 10 to 20 years. Here you've got Hurricane Sandy affected New York and New Jersey primarily 10 years ago. Um, certainly Hurricane Katrina. Believe it or not, with Katrina, more than 50% of life loss came from indirect causes, um, largely from exposure, actually. So, and then I'm going to pointed this out to you, for the 59 other events, so for all 59 events, total life loss was about 3, 000, just over 3,200, and that made up about 44%, so almost half of your, your total life loss came from indirect causes for those 59 events. That's, that's significant, right? So this, this, really, this really got us going the Rappaport and Blanchard data into kind of trying to come up with a way to estimate indirect life loss and at least at least quantify it so that we could inform risk our, our risk assessments. We could inform risk risk based decisions by at least having some even even if it's a cursory or crude estimate of indirect life loss alongside our direct life loss estimates from LifeSim to help support decisions for our, our dams and levees. So as we dug into the data, and, and like I said, I, I, I get into this more in my presentation with the consequences training, data availability is, is really a challenge. When you're trying to figure out, you know, we, we've talked about population and population at risk for direct life loss estimates and life sim. It's, it's pretty clear how we come up with that estimate of population at risk, right? It's all the people that could get wet for a given flood event. Well, it's, it's much less clear for indirect life loss because a po people well outside of your disaster area or, or your flood zone could be negatively impacted by that flood and trying to figure out how many additional people might be impacted is a challenge and trying to get that data from past events is also quite a challenge. Based on the data we were able to come up with, we broke the impacted population. So we came up with this term IPAR, impacted population at risk. We broke that out into two groups, evacuees and non-evacuees, right? And we included situations that had, where we had good data, where we didn't see indirect life loss um, within some of these groups. For the evacuees group, generally, 
you see these really small mortality rates. It's because we're talking about really, really large numbers of people impacted by these events. And then as a percentage of that impacted par, the number of live loss, that, that proportion or that percentage is actually quite low. Um, Rita and Sandy, higher than most hurricanes. You've, you've heard some of the horror stories from Rita probably. You know, uh, a bus caught on fire that killed 24 people. They were largely folks with, from a, with limited mobility from uh, a nursing home. So they didn't have the ability to get out of the bus. But things like that, um, Woody talked to you a little earlier this week about Teton and the direct and indirect life loss from Teton. Again, this is just the evacuees group. Katrina, believe it or not, had a fairly significant number of people lose their lives while evacuating. It's interesting how this stuff gets communicated because if, if I'd had to guess before we did this research, I would have definitely expected that indirect life loss in the evacuees group would have been higher for Rita than for Katrina because of all that's been made of that Rita evacuation. It happened three weeks after Katrina. Evacuation rate was about 95%. It was quite high. Um, you know, Harris County and the city of Houston made the decision not to evacuate during Hurricane Car Harvey, largely because of what happened during the Hurricane Rita evacuation. There's all sorts of pictures on the internet of, you know, cars just parked on the highway, even though they use ContraFlow. So it, it surprised me to see Katrina end up being higher than Rita for indirect life loss among the evacuees group. And then campfire, this, we needed something with, with really limited data. We wanted something that could kind of define our upper bound, if you will. And when you're talking about stress-induced fatalities where you don't have direct interaction with the hazard itself, we thought that a fire that's billowing towards your home, you know, if any of you have seen pictures from wildfires in California, it's kind of apocalyptic. And, and the pictures post wildfire, if you saw the pictures from Santa Rosa a few years ago or from Paradise, the city of Paradise, Cal town of Paradise, California, a few years ago, it, it, it almost looks like what you'd imagine nuclear winter to look like. Yeah, um, it really is apocalyptic looking. So we thought you probably can't create a more stressful situation than needing to evacuate from a fire or in, in a matter of minutes or you're going to die. And you're almost certainly losing your home whether you evacuate or not, right? It's, it's, so even though it's not a flood situation, we thought that that was a fairly good representation of an upper bound. And then, you know, a rapid onset dam breach would be about as close to a situation like campfires you could get in the context of, of a flood emergency. And we saw something, we saw the effects of that with the Teton dam failure, I think. Then looking at the non-evacuees group, so these are people that might be in the path of the flood or, or outside the path of the flood that lose power, we have these fatality rates. And, and you can see that Hurricane Maria, Maria and, and Hurricane Katrina are, are our highest fatality rate estimates for the non-evacuees. Um, Katrina, significant issue with prolonged exposure, right? and extreme temperatures, a lot of people lost their lives that way. And then Maria had an extended power problem, right? There are parts of the island of Puerto Rico that didn't get power back for a year, which is rather, rather extreme. All right, this is a busy slide. I'm gonna kind of go through the, the different causes of mortality for each one of these groups. Some of them will be similar. You'll see some differences. So in both cases, you'll see a health factor or a cardio factor. Example of this, cardiac arrest during evacuation from various Atlantic hurricanes, um, heart attacks while evacuating during the Teton dam failure event. So Woody talked to you a little bit about those. 
primary influence factors. So first it's figuring out, hey, what causes indirect life loss? And then what influences the likelihood of that indirect life loss occurring? So when you're talking about uh, health or cardio related, loss of life from indirect causes, what, what could increase the likelihood of that happening? Well, age, you know, there's, there's a correlation between age and cardiovascular disease. Health, you don't, you don't have to be old to have health challenges that might also increase the likelihood of cardiac arrest. And then intensity, how stressful of a situation are you put in? Is it you've got several hours or, or days to evacuate and your home and belongings and family are all likely to be okay? Or is it you've got minutes to take a protective action and, you know, your kids are at school and your your spouse is at, is at work? You know, something like that that would cause extreme stress, particularly if you weren't with those people that you care about. So there's, there's a pretty large range of what that intensity factor could mean relative to indirect life loss. Exposure, talking about exposure, it, it prolonged exposure to suboptimal conditions created by a disaster. If that's combined with extreme temperatures, you know, people, nine people die from hyperthermia, hyperthermia, is extreme heat uh, or, or disease from extreme heat. Hypothermia is disease from extreme cold, right? So hypothermia, so think of Hurricane Sandy and a hurricane with snowfall and freezing temperatures or below freezing temperatures. Hyperthermia, think of Hurricane Rita and a whole bunch of people trapped while evacuating exposed to extreme heat that had run out of gas, right? So again, age, health, temperature, and duration. A age and health are gonna show up a lot because of the correlation between health and age and these factors initiating something that could lead to mortality, right? Then accidents, when you're in a, a high stress situation and maybe you're not taking the same care that you normally would because you don't have the same kind of time, bad things can happen, right? Someone running to their truck, holding a whole bunch of stuff in their arms, accidentally discharges their firearm and kills themselves. That, that sounds like a pretty random event, but because of the stress or intensity, associated with a disaster like a dam breach, you could see how something like that would happen. I mentioned the bus fire from Hurricane Rita. So different, different sorts of accidents can happen while evacuating, they cause, which lead to direct life loss. Uh, traffic congestion, distance to shelter intensity. So the length of time that you're on a road, uh, think, about, think about any road trip you've ever been on, you know, you're probably okay for a few hours. You might not even need to make a stop. You get into that half day range, you probably need to stop for gas once, maybe bio break, maybe get some food or something to drink. You start extending that further. You're getting tired. You don't have, you, you know, the same attentiveness that you might have before. And all of that stuff can increase the likelihood of an accident. All right, now the non evacuees group, very similar. You see health related cardio. Um, deaths associated with strenuous physical labor. So you, you come back to your house, you've got several fallen trees in your yard, branches in your yard, a tree fell on your roof, and you go about trying to clear that stuff. And maybe you're not in great shape or you've got pre existing health conditions. You fall off your roof, you going to cardiac arrest because you're putting too much stress on your body. Um, also, think of medical facilities. If you 
ever want to read the book, uh, it's it's not a happy read, but it's an informative one. The five days at Memorial Hospital. That's that's a rather famous situation where a doctor was going around and and with a marker making decisions about who who they could save and who they couldn't, right? So that was associated with with multiple deaths that were health related, right? Compounded by lack of power, and then this isolationism factor that has to do with really the ability of even regional or national resources to provide aid. Think of, you know, think of Hurricane Maria in the island of Puerto Rico after the hurricane came through and how much of a challenge it was to get the necessary resources to the people on the island of Puerto Rico. And the really significant emergency response and humanitarian effort that, that went into that. And even with all of that effort, it took months to get power back in some locations and, and people were still living in really difficult conditions for up to a year after, right? Exposure, uh, I mentioned Katrina, exposure was a real issue. Uh, people tracked in attics and exposure to extreme heat, carbon monoxide poisoning during Hurricane Sandy, so exposure to extreme cold and you know this is new york city a lot of people live in in apartments or condos and high rises there's and and tried to run generators indoors so that's a that's a problem if you don't have a way to exhaust that carbon monoxide um and then hypothermia you know extreme cold causing multiple deaths in in sandy aftermath a lot of factors associated with exposure or influence factors that compound how how much that exposure can impact somebody. Um, if you're you've got pre-existing health conditions, there's extreme temperature, there's no power, and you're trapped in an attic, that's a problem. If there's no ability to get resources to you, you're going to be exposed for a longer period of time. You can see how all those things begin to compound. Okay, and then finally, accidents, uh, electrocution, you know, turning on a light switch after a flood in your house and it's sending a surge that, that kills you. We've read about that. Um, vehicle deaths from striking down trees. So, so these are, it, it says vehicles, so you immediately think, oh, shouldn't that be an evacuees? No, we're talking about driving around after an event and roadways and other transportation infrastructure have been altered because of the event. And so people crashing into downed trees, you know, things being in places they aren't normally causing accidents that lead to people losing their lives. People falling in darks, in dark passages or stairwells when the power's out. You know, these things that sound pretty random and, you know, well, we can't really account for that. But when you're talking about a really large scale event and how it increases the likelihood of any of these things occurring, in the aggregate, these things start to be pretty additive. And when you consider how all of these things might combine to contribute to excess mortality from a disaster, it really compels you to take a closer look at indirect life loss. Okay, that is by far the busiest slide I have in this presentation. So we should cruise a little more after this. All right, so I mentioned this idea of impacted population at risk. I'm gonna to talk to you about how we calculate impacted PAR, and then I'm gonna take you through the example and talk to you a little bit about how you get information from LifeSim to estimate indirect life loss, right? So impacted population I par, the group of people affected by the suboptimal conditions created by a disaster before, during, or after. So for our non-evacuees group, I par, no evac, that's going to equal your population at risk, which you can get from LifeSim, minus the number of people who evacuated, which you can also get from LifeSim, plus the people with no power, you can do some mapping in LifeSim to come up with that, minus direct life loss, right? So we don't want to count people who already lost their lives from direct impacts from flooding in our indirect life loss computation, right? That would be 
we we want to avoid um, killing killing a person at risk twice in our in our con life loss consequence estimates. So that's our IPAR for our non-evacuees group, and for our evacuees group, it's going to be evacuees minus direct life loss on roads, right? So you've done a fair bit of work um, in workshops over the last couple of days, building a life sim model, including a road network and destinations, simulating evacuation, and coming up with that that life loss on roads estimate. So it's number of people who evacuate minus the number of people who lose their lives on roads. And you can get both of those estimates from LifeSim. So LifeSim is going to give you that IPAR evac number within its output, right? The IPAR no evac is a, is a little more of a, a challenge. All right, so calculating non-evacuees. Remember, this is our equation here. PAR minus evacuees plus people with no power minus direct life loss. So if you view your summary average results by table, you grab your PAR over and under the age of 65, add those together, you sum them together to get your total PAR. Then you subtract your evacuees. You can get that from your summary average results table as well. So that PAR mobilized estimate, that's your attribute in LifeSim. And then you're going to subtract your total life loss. Now, obviously, LifeSim presents life loss using a statistical summary. So 95th percentile, third quartile, mean and median, first quartile, and fifth percentile, and then min and max as well. But for, for this particular computation, using the median is sufficient. I talked to you a little bit earlier this week about when setting up a structure inventory about shadow evacuation, and we talked about the warning in PAI, the warning and evacuation research we got from the lady in Sorensen. Um, their white paper on PAI found that about an average of 26%, so about a quarter, of people in adjacent zones to places that were explicitly ordered to evacuate ended up evacuating as well. So when I say that, I mean, uh, imagine that there's an area that's given an evacuation order and areas outside of that emergency planning zone in life sim, people close to it choose to voluntarily evacuate, right? So how could you handle that in life sim? Um, there's different ways. You could extend your structure inventory and just say, I'm going to evacuate all of these people because I don't have enough information to say that these people wouldn't get an evacuation order. Or you could go, you know, quarter, half of a mile beyond that buffered extent you use for your structure inventory and put in an evacuation rate, create an emergency planning zone, put in an evacuation rate for it. Use it, just have it be a triangular distribution and have your bounds look like this, right? 12% would be your max lower bound, 49% would be your max upper bound, and 26% would be your most likely outcome. And LifeSim will sample evacuation from that group as part of the simulation. It'll also help you account for cars driving into an area um, that maybe shouldn't be there, which is certainly possible during during an event. So that's how you can consider shadow evacuation. That would also get added into your evacuees group, right? Your PAR mobilized group. All right. Now, getting that evacuees from LifeSim. So you, you've got your PAR mobilized, and then you've got your life loss caught on roads. So that's how you're going to estimate your, your IPAR evac is just the, the PAR mobilized less that direct life loss on roads. So you're going to be able to get the information to come up with these IPAR estimates in LifeSim or from the, the results tables in LifeSim. The only thing you need to get, getting back to that non-evacuous group, is that people no power estimate. And that's, that's not an easy number to come up with by any means. So I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk to you about that a little more as we go through this example. All right, so the method. 
so our, our method is, is, like I said, data availability was a real challenge, but we needed to come up with a way to at least estimate indirect life loss. The, the feedback we got during the, I, the external peer review was basically, hey, you guys have a really great start. It, it's not quite there yet. So don't go, don't go too far with your estimates. Don't, don't, basically I, the way I took it was, you, you know, if, if you get too finite in your estimates, you, you might be creating some false precision. So acknowledge how much uncertainty there is associated with this method and maybe use a range or something like that. So, and I'll, and I'll get to that. <clears throat> so we have really just a handful of events you can see kind of other hurricanes so that's we had this category for kind of generic atlantic hurricanes so think mostly down in the down in the gulf in the southeastern part of the united states then we have you know some specific events that we were able to find enough data on to include here you know, orville the Oroville dam event, you know, there wasn't a failure, but there was a mass evacuation. Hurricane Sandy, Rita, Katrina, Teton dam failure, and then campfire. Health and age factor, critical health facility evacuation, intensity factor, extreme temperature, and evacuation duration. So I'm going to go through each one of these. So cardio deaths, we use the CDC data, which they they offer a cardiovascular disease per 100,000 at the county level. And so you can get uh, fairly good estimates from that. So that's, that's how we're handling the health and age factor right now. Critical health facility evacuation. So it, in LifeSim, you've got your structure data set, right? And then you can, you can look at, um, how many hospitals you've got, where they are in your study area, and then how many nursing facilities, nursing home facilities, right? Uh, we can share the, the hazardous occupancy type descriptions. I think COM6 is a hospital and RES 4 or 5 is a, is a nursing home. I'd have to look. But all that information is going to be available for you in your structure inventory. You might have to do a little extra work to find out if they have plans to evacuate or if they would be able to evacuate during a flood emergency. So that might involve calling them and, and talking to someone. But that factor is based on, you know, would they choose to evacuate and then would they actually have the ability to evacuate? Intensity factor, um, that's one that's got a significant range to it, right? You, you know, it, it, at, at a, the lowest score it would be there's a, hur a category two hurricane coming in four days. Um, monitor and or suggest evacuating or voluntary. This is a voluntary evacuation order, something like that. Where you know category two is not that concerning. Might your home might get damaged. Your life's probably not at risk. That sort of thing, and then all the way up to, you know, a, a fire bearing down on your home that's less than a quarter of a mile away and you have only minutes to take a protective action and get out of there, otherwise you're, you're in grave danger, right? So intensity factor's got a pretty wide range because of how much it can impact the potential for indirect life loss. Extreme temperature, um, for our suite of events, really, Rita and Katrina for extreme heat and Sandy for extreme cold. None of these other events really had a, an extreme temperature issue. I guess you could argue you campfire did because of the fire, but that, that wasn't what caused the indirect mortality. And then evacuation duration. Remember I talked about how long are you on road. So how we broke that out is in the stages effectively. So if Evacuation duration is less than four hours, really not an issue. If it's four to eight hours, um, or, or sorry, four to 12 hours, I think, it's, it's moderate, you know, 
could be an issue, but not going to significantly increase the likelihood of indirect life loss. And then if it's over 12 hours, that's the threshold where we said this, this could be a problem, right? So warning time and potential damage, that's your intensity factor, extreme heat or extreme cold, and then how much time are you going to spend in your car? And then each one of these factors has a score associated with it, right? You see this over here. You see intensity factor has a huge range, and that's because the 1 to 5, 1 to 3 didn't allow for enough variation or the variation that we needed to allow within our small data set to account for how much the intensity of an event can contribute to the likelihood of indirect life loss. Then you calculate the score. Some of these are independent and additive. Some of these are dependent and, and multiplied. And we come up with, we have what we call par points, which is over here. And then fatality points, which is par points times the combination of these factors here. And that created this kind of weighted scale for us where fatalities associated with each one of these events, campfires, the highest for indirect life loss, all other, you know, hurricanes or kind of these generic hurricanes, the lowest. And then a really minor event would be, would be that two point. And then we're doing similar thing with non-evacuees, slightly different factors, right? Response capability and isolationism. Those two things sound similar. Um, they're, they're quite nuanced. Health and age factor and extreme temperature, that's going to be the same as what you have for your evacuees. Um, expectation for a power problem and the duration of the power problem, right? Is it, is it days, so not that big of a deal? Is it weeks or is it, is it months? And if it's months, that, that could be a real problem. Exposure, how long are you exposed to those suboptimal conditions created by the disaster? And then response capability and isolation. So response capability is, hey, your city or the emergency responders in your city have been incapacitated by this event or in your county, but are there neighboring counties or municipalities that could get aid to you with inside of a half a day? or a day. So generally within the contiguous United States, that response capability should be fairly good, right? In, in more remote areas of the country, you might have an issue. Isolationism has more to do with the location of the area being impacted by the disaster, right? So if it's a remote village in Alaska, your isolationism factor is, is probably going to be high and your response capability is going to be low. That's, that's what Hurricane Maria is right here. You see low response capability and high isolationism factor. So those two things compound one another in our computation. So duration of time, people will be limited from leaving home or getting to a hospital if they need medical care. Ability of surrounding communities and emergency responders to help. And ability of external communities to respond and assist. So you, you can see these are very similar, but they're slightly different. And then we're doing the same sort of thing. Each one of those factors is associated with a score. And we've got this fatality rate point. So what you do with your event, say that you, you scored it out and you slot somewhere between Rita and Maria we would say, all right, the fatalities associated with Rita and Maria are such, so your range is Rita's to Maria's, and then you could do some interpolation to come up with a median estimate. And that's as far as we're comfortable going, saying we think indirect life loss is somewhere between here and here, and our best estimate is, is about here. And that's as far as as far as we're going. We we'd originally gone as far as creating an uncertainty distribution and sampling from that distribution, but rather than doing that, doing that, we're just showing a range with a best estimate. Now, all right. So 
So talk to you a little bit about how you can get the data for IPAR non-evacuees and IPAR for evacuees. I'm going to walk you through an example of the method because you can get a lot of this information from LifeSim. Some of it's going to come out of life, um, other sources. So I mentioned the CDC health and age factor. That's the link right there. That'll be available for you in your workbook. And you can see that there's, you know, if you were to look at where we've seen some tropical cyclones hit, like Katrina, that's an area that's generally got a higher health and age factor. This is showing adults over the age of 35. When you go, there are several different options. So when you go to this website, there's several different options for whether you're grabbing everyone with cardiovascular disease or people with specific types of cardiovascular disease or certain age groups, I would encourage you to just grab everyone that has cardiovascular disease so that, that all, the aggregate number for your particular study area. This particular example was a dam in New England. And so the individual that did this went and found that, hey, the health and age factors relatively low for this particular or, or would be relatively low for this particular area and so they gave it a you, you'll give it a score anywhere from one to five right this was you can see the in green was 201 which puts you probably in the one to two range actually puts you in the two to the two range for that particular county in Vermont. So that's a two for the health and age factor. Don't expect that to be a significant contributor to indirect life loss in this remote area of Vermont. Then how am I going to come up with an estimate of extreme temperature? Well, we know Vermont gets pretty cold in the winter. So they did something kind of interesting here. They used actually a, a maps generally for plant hardiness. Use the plant hardiness map, which looks at the mean low temperature or the mean daily annual average low temperature. And in this area of Vermont, the lowest it gets is between minus 20 to minus 15 degrees. So they assign a factor of one because <clears throat> the reason being is because most likely the time and event that, uh, like this would occur is during high water runoff, which is during snowmelt season. So it's possible it could happen during the dead of winter, just pretty unlikely, more likely that it would happen during spring when there's quite a bit of rain and snowmelt and there's high water runoff. So based on the likelihood of that event occurring in the spring, we're not concerned about the extreme cold, even though in the winter, you can make the argument that extreme cold could be a possibility. If you wanted something that was more representative of the possible range for the whole year, you might go through this a couple different times and say, yeah, we've got a high extreme temperature factor if this were to happen in the winter. So I'm going to place a range on my indirect life loss estimate that accounts for the extreme cold possibility. Okay, power problem. This is the one I'm going to spend probably the most time on. So those first two factors, you got that information outside of life, right? You don't, you don't need LifeSim for coming up with those factors. In this case, I would say LifeSim can be really helpful. So you can pull this high field data, it's electrical grid GIS data, it's, it's available um, at this Arc open data it's at arcgis.com. So on that Esri website, you can pull this high field data that has electric grid information for the entire country. And you can go make an assessment of how that electric grid looks in your area, where the substations are, what might be impacted relative to that utility infrastructure for your particular study area. In this case, the dam's up here, the town of Springfield, Vermont's right here, and you can see that there are a couple major lines that go down into the city, right? Now, it's possible that this line up here could be impacted, 
but it's unlikely that this major line to the south would be, right? So most of Windsor County in Vermont's probably okay. It could be that the city of Springfield itself loses power for a period of time or parts of it lose power for a period of time. But those areas are probably going to be the same areas that are directly affected by the flooding. So we don't have a significant a significant increase to our population at risk with this people no power for this particular example. Um, the individual who did this did a nice job pulling historic data from Hurricane Irene in 2011 that was actually quite devastating for parts of Vermont. And there were 12 communities that lost power for days. But remember, days is not something that we would consider a significant contribution to a power problem or a prolonged power problem that could really increase the propensity for indirect life loss. So, based on the mapping, historic information, and the extent of potential power loss, that individual who did this work came up with a rating of one, which I think is appropriate. This is something exposure duration. This is absolutely something you can get from LifeSim, right? You can, you can look at, you can use that uh, that hydraulic importer and click on any grid cell in, in your flood and get a hydrograph that looks like this. You know this from your, your hydraulic import. And then you can set, now the next part of this is a little more delicate and, and quite important. You need to make sure you're coming up with a reasonable depth estimate, right? So they used flows over bank. Do you, and, and certainly be easier for you all to answer if I was in the class, but so yell or, or maybe Woody or Stephanie can help out. Is overbank a good representation of exposure duration and, and why or why not? Anybody? Can you repeat the question? Is, is flow over bank, so water getting outside the channel and getting over bank, is that a good representation of exposure duration? So you can see what they did here. They said water's over bank at that 15 foot stage at this particular point in the river, and they're calling this kind of a a central point in the city of Springfield. So they're using that as a representative representation of exposure for, for the entire city. They're saying at the 15 foot stage, water gets out of channel. I'm asking, is that a good representation of exposure duration for, how, for that period that it's out of channel or is something else a better representation? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. It seems good. It seems good. Okay, why? Well, if there's some water, then when it's back in the stage, Would be, I, I would say that 
overbank might not be a great representation of exposure duration. And the reason why is if, if water's overbank and really shallow, that's not likely to cause much of a problem. If there's five feet of flooding in homes that people are stuck in along the river, I'd be relatively concerned about that, right? So the, the nature of the flooding is an important consideration when you're talking about exposure duration. So, and, and with respect to the person that did this, I think they did a really nice job. And when you need to come up with something, they said, all right, overbank's a, overbank's a good representation because it's easy for me to define that. I might have said, what's likely to put water in the first floor of most of these structures close to the river or something like that? How much, how much flooding would that need to be? Is that stage 20? If I move up to stage 20, that exposure duration decreases by about 24 hours, right? So maybe it's a, a day less. So just, just an important thing to think about as you go through something like this is what's an appropriate representation of exposure duration? You know, what, what type of exposure am I concerned about people coming into contact with for a prolonged period of time, right? And, and shallow flooding that's not moving terribly quick, that's, that's probably not going to significantly increase the likelihood of indirect life loss or direct life loss. It certainly can. The presence of water creates opportunities for mortality that weren't there before, right? Um, but I'd be more concerned about a little more depth than overbank. Okay. Response capability. Now you could, this is, you don't have to use LifeSim for this, but you can. And the, the fewer programs you have to use to get answers, I find um, the better. I, I do as much mapping as I can in LifeSim. I'm very, comfort, very comfortable in Arc Pro uh, when it doesn't blow up my laptop, but I, I generally prefer to use LifeSim because it's fast and it's easy. So any mapping or editing I can do to polygons, polylines, point shapes, whatever like that in LifeSim, I'm always going to choose to use LifeSim. So the same is true for pulling information I need for indirect life loss, right? Easy to pull up a base map in LifeSim. I just grabbed a, a, a basic screenshot here. If we were being thoughtful about it, you'd, you'd probably overlay one of your um, particular flood events to look at what's wet. So. I know that the dam's right here, and the outflow goes down here to the Connecticut River, and it's going to impact Baltimore, North Springfield, Springfield, all the way down to Charlestown, New Hampshire, right here. Um, I would, I, this is, I, I'm from this area. I'm, I grew up in a small town in New Hampshire, so I, I worked with the individual who was doing this, and I said, I, I think your response capability factor is pretty low. You know, the upper valleys right here in New Hampshire, there's, there's a fairly large population there, and, and they could get here in, in less than two hours, no problem. I believe that. But um, this person had gone through the elicitation process and talked to an emergency manager in, in Springfield, and based on the feedback from them during that elicitation, they said, mm, I, I, I think that would be more of a challenge based on the information I got back from during the elicitation. So I said, you know, by all means, use the information that you got as part of this, part of the work you're doing. So rather than giving it an assignment of one and saying that response capability is low, he said, based on some of the concerns I heard from this emergency manager during the elicitation, I'm gonna give this an assignment of two. You know, so it's one, two, or three for this particular factor. I'm gonna give it an assignment of two. Isolationism. Generally, your isolationism factor is going to be low. In most areas of the country, your isolationism factor is going to be low. 
when you start talking about um, U.S. territories, particularly islands in the Pacific in, the hur in Hurricane Alley or islands in the Caribbean that are often exposed to hurricanes, remote areas of, of Alaska or Hawaii, certainly Hawaii would fit that description, that's when you, you start to think about isolationism. Isolationism within the contiguous United States would be um, really remote areas where a flood event would cut them off almost entirely from the rest of us such that it would be a real challenge to get them aid. Springfield, Vermont is, is no such place, so that, that gets a, a low isolationism rating. Critical health facility factors. So absolutely something you can use LifeSim for. You can use aerial imagery, you know, Google Earth Pro or one of the mapping base layers available to you in LifeSim. You can use your structure inventory. Um, that's, that's probably what I would use or where I would start and figure out, hey, do I have cr critical health facilities that might need to evacuate? Springfield has, has three uh, critical health facilities, hospital and nursing home. I'll, I'll be honest, I'm not terribly familiar with adult daycare. Um, I, I, I don't know exactly what that looks like or what, what evacuation from an adult daycare would entail. Um, it is flood prone in this case but it has a uh, limited number of occupants and the individual did this work determined that evacuation, if necessary, would be relatively easy. And they did have transportation available. Uh, I should have made that note on here. Intensity, this is, this is a, a real challenge. You saw that the intensity factor went from zero to 100. Probably wondering why why you have one to three, one to five, and then one to a hundred. Like I said, it's because of there's such a wide range in potential outcomes relative to intensity and type of event that it created kind of a kind of a challenge for us when we were trying to understand how each one of these data points led to indirect life loss. And the thing that was hardest for us to reconcile was this intensity factor. And that's why we've got that really large range, right? Person did a nice job of thinking through it. Um, you know, what's warning time look like? Is there likely to be very little warning time or evacuation opportunity time. What's the community awareness like? Are local emergency managers prepared or not? Um, Avon gated spillway here. I, you know, most spillways on core dams in New England are ungated OG weir spillways. So it's, it's certainly not uncommon for a New England dam to be constructed that way, but it also means that your, our ability to induce surcharge or influence downstream flow once water gets above the spillway is, is pretty much nil, right? Rival time of flooding in, key down, in downstream populated areas is less than an hour and a half. Um, you you could use two hours. You could use you could use a different range here. They chose to use 90 minutes. They looked at the intensity factors. Okay, Teton Dam was about a 75. People immediately downstream. Water arrived quickly. Campfire, wildfire was 100. Most hurricanes are one. So I've got a dam failure. There is an emergency management plan. People are aware of that the dam exists, and they have, 
you know, a few hours time to evacuate. So I'm going to say that that's lower than Teton, but higher than most hurricanes. So they arrived somewhere in the middle, but because it's got such a range, they used two different values here to add some uncertainty about their indirect life loss estimate. Evacuation duration, that is something that you can get from LifeSim, right? You've got, you, you build your road network in LifeSim, you have all these destinations, you run a simulation, then you can go to your evacuation outflow, right? And you can look at how long, how many people get on roads and for how long, right? You can see that period of how, how when you, you see these kind of spikes, a lot of people getting on the road, and you can get time evacuating. You can use that histogram as well here to see about how long are people evacuating, and then you can look at your destination outflow to see if any one of your destinations have uh, a lot of people going to them that, and it's taking several hours to get there, something like that. I would start with your time evacuating histogram, and if that doesn't have anything over eight hours or six hours, then you could safely say that it's it's relatively low, right? Evacuation duration is not going to be a factor that contributes to indirect life loss. So you can get a lot of information to support your indirect life loss estimate from LifeSim, and I would encourage you to do so. There's only a couple things that you'd need to get externally. And a lot of the maps are, that you would use to support this effort are already going to be built into LifeSim, save the, the power grid, right? That's going to be the only thing that you would need to go get in addition to your, the existing mapping that you've done for your direct life loss estimates, right? All right, check on learning. I think I'm just over the hour that I had, so I'll try to get through this quick. What percentage of fatalities from the 59 tropical storms, Rappaport and Blanchard considered, were attributed to indirect life loss? So for all 59 events, about how much of the total life loss was from indirect causes? A, almost half, B, about 20, a quarter, C, about three quarters, or D, less than 10%? Jeffy, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, I can. Everyone's got uh, letters for, for holding up, so waiting to see the responses. I'm seeing okay. several A's, almost half. All right, let's, several A's, that's correct. All right, the primary cause of indirect life loss is cardiovascular failure, power loss, hypothermia, or vehicle incident, accident. Just a moment, Jeffrey. We're waiting on a few responses. I'm seeing B and also a C. B and C. Okay. A C power loss, um, a C vehicle accident. So this is on me a little bit. Uh, we we talk a lot about the power about the about indirect life loss relative to power problems. And that's because power problems are antecedent to so many other factors that lead to indirect life loss. But the data we have shows that about a third of indirect life loss, excuse me, at least from the Rappaport and Blanchard study, about a third of indirect life loss comes from cardi cardiovascular failure. So um, the answer we're looking for is A, but power loss is antecedent to several other factors that and, and that's about, that ends up being about, it, it, it's, it's a, a few percentage points difference. So these two combined make up about 60% of total indirect life loss. Okay. Jeffy, uh, can you describe why, why vehicle accident was not what you were looking for there? There were a couple people who chose vehicle accident. Yeah, sure. Um, so vehicle accidents on their own, when we're talking about vehicle accidents relative to indirect life loss, you can have vehicle accidents 
during evacuation, but if you remember from the warning and PAI presentation on Tuesday, generally during mass evacuation, there are relatively few vehicle accidents because people are moving quite slowly and our, the sociologists found that they're generally more courteous. We're talking about vehicle accidents relative to indirect life loss. We're talking about accidents that take place after the event in the non-evacuees group. So people who fall into that non-evacuees group, they didn't evacuate and take a protective action, get out of the area. They're driving around the impacted area uh, after the event and uh, maybe a traffic light's not working the way it's supposed to and they get into an accident, they crash into a downed tree, something like that. And those occurrences are, are relatively rare. So vehicle accidents, when you're talking about the primary cause of indirect life loss and you're talking about really high levels of mortality, particularly for some of these events like Katrina and Rita, those vehicle accidents among your non-evacuees group um, make up a pretty small contribution to that aggregate. Does that make sense? I see some yeses. That makes sense. Okay, great. All right, if someone wades through ponded floodwaters and gets electrocuted, causing them to lose their life, this is a direct flood fatality, true or false? I see responses that include A and responses that include B. <laughs> okay, so, so if you said true, you're, you're correct. Electrocution is, is a difficult one because elect, electrocution um, falling under the power problem is, can cause direct and indirect life loss. Um, a good example, uh, it's actually a point on our direct fatality rate curves in LifeSync. Uh, it's a low hazard point. There are two gentlemen in their 20s, friends, wading through uh, floodwaters uh, near Lake Attucks and Barker in Houston during, uh, during the Hurricane Harvey aftermath. And one of them entered ponded floodwaters and felt an electric charge and told his friend to stay back. Um, he was electrocuted and ended up losing his life, but his friend lived. The presence of water in that situation led to him losing his life. And we would call that a direct flood fatality because the presence of water in an area that it wouldn't typically be combined with the electric charge from the down power line caused life loss. Now, if you're walking through your house and it's not flooded and you flick on a light switch after, after an event and you get electrocuted and lose your life that way, that would be indirect. So electrocution can be a little bit challenging. The way to think about it to make it easy is, were you interacting with water when you were electrocuted? If you were, that would be a direct flood fatality. If you were not, we would generally call that indirect. Okay, LifeSim estimates indirect flood fatalities. Hopefully everyone gets this, true or false? I see everyone with, oh, no, we've got a couple of different ones. We've got A and B. Okay. Life sim, life sim explicitly estimates direct consequences. So with the exception of the ECAM plugin, which Stephanie talked about a little bit the other day, You'll remember because she talked about how she couldn't stand the thought of losing charcuterie. So that's, that's your indirect economic loss. And LifeSim does run ECAM within its framework. So that's the only indirect consequence that you can get from LifeSim. In the context of life loss, LifeSim, the LifeSim method that you've been learning about this week estimates direct flood fatality. 
you can use a lot of the outputs from LifeSim and the functionality in LifeSim to support your indirect life loss estimate, but LifeSim itself does not estimate indirect blood fatalities. 